Good afternoon, everyone. This is Marie. Just to let you know, we will start uh, the webinar in five minutes. You are all muted. That will remain the same during the webinar. So I will explain later the procedures to ask questions. Just uh, let me know in case you have problems hearing us. You can uh, drop that in the chat box and we will try to sort out the technical issues then.
Good afternoon, everyone. So welcome to the webinar on the Audiovisual Media Services Directive. I'm Marie, I work for EDF, and I will give you a quick introduction and introduce today's speakers. So next slide, please. So I am the moderator, as you can see, uh, I work here at EDF as policy coordinator. And then we have our speakers that are sitting next to me and opposite. Uh, there is Lara Orlandi from the European Commission, DG Connect, and Alejandro Moledo, who is also a policy coordinator here at EDF. And in the next slide, I will give you some short information about practical issues and housekeeping rules. First of all, just to let you know, this webinar is recorded. We also will have a transcript afterwards, which will be published. So you can request that and it will be published on our website. We will not mention any names today for privacy reasons. And also for accessibility, we have both captioning, so speech to text. The link for this you find in the chat box if you want to use this. And we also have sign language interpretation, which you should be able to see on a separate screen. We will not uh, allow any oral questions. So all the questions, please use the questions box in the menu. And we will then read out the questions um, in the order that they appear. And we will treat them in two separate uh, question times, one in, in the middle between the two speakers and one at the very end. Finally, for those who have some technical issues accessing uh, from a desktop, you can also access the webinar from a mobile device. For that, you will need to download the app of GoToWebinar, or you can also access the webinar via phone. And for that, you will find a phone number and an access code when you click on the link to joining the webinar. Today, so I will give an overview of our program. Uh, first of all, uh, as I said, the introduction by myself. Then we will talk about what is the Audiovisual Media Services Directive and how it will benefit you. This will be done by Lara. Then we have a short break for questions. Then we will have the second presentation by Alejandro about accessibility of audiovisual media. And in the end, we will have questions and answers again. I would suggest since the name Audiovisual Media Services Directive is very long, and I think most of you know what we're talking about, we will shorten this to AVMSD to make it a little bit easier for the captioner. Um, and I think like this, we can avoid a, a little bit this very, very long uh, and uh, complicated name. So next, quest, uh, next slide, please. Uh, just quickly about EDF. Um, you know that we are an umbrella organization of um, persons, uh, an organization of other, uh, sorry, umbrella organization of disabled persons organizations uh, in Europe. And we represent about 100 million persons with disabilities. And we work on different policy areas of which one is accessibility and of course also accessibility to uh, audiovisual media. And this is what we're going to be talking about today. And uh, as you can see on the screen also, our motto is nothing about us without us. So we are really happy that you're joining us and I will hand over to the first speaker, which is Lara. Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, thank you for this very nice introduction, Marie. And uh, thank you also for this uh, invitation to the webinar today. My name is La Orlandi. I am a policy officer at the uh, European Commission. And I was a part of the team who negotiated this directive. As Marie said, uh, the, the name is a little bit complicated, Audiovisual Media Services Directive. But in the end, like this complicated term, um, how can I say the, um, uh, the devil is in the details because of course it really depends which services are covered, which, which aren't covered. So I will give you a little bit an overview of the main revised provisions and uh, what are the overall objectives of the, of the directive 
And for you, the most relevant uh, provision is, of course, on accessibility. And I think Alejandro will, uh, will provide you with a very good overview on that one. So the next slide here, um, as you can see, I think we all remember the traditional uh, TV sets, which many of you might still have at home. I myself don't. So this is, of course, uh, uh, the old directive uh, was called Te Television Without Frontiers. Now, um, and this was in, in the 80s, it was then changed uh, and uh, given the name audiovisual media uh, services, which is a completely different concept because it covers, we can already see the next slide, and this is, um, it covers different services. So on the, on the one hand, we have the traditional uh, TV broadcasters, which we call linear services, because you just switch on the TV and <laughs> get the audiovisual content which is broadcast so there is a temporal element in it in that you cannot really choose the content and now i mean recently we've seen uh, a really like a paradigm shift let's say that more and more consumers are uh, are watching video on demand so video on demand i'm sure you're all aware of services such as netflix hbo and so on which which really changed the media landscape drastically because you can actually you as a consumer can choose which content uh, to watch you can go through you can decide maybe you even have uh, difficulties on, on on finding a choice so this is the video on demand and then uh, this was very important during the negotiations we managed to extend some of the regulatory framework to video sharing platforms. So again, a little bit a technical name. What it means basically is uh, you can think of YouTube as a typical video sharing platform uh, where you have user generated content so that users can actually uh, share their, their, their own videos. I mean, it can be also like under the, it, it can be also professionally produced, of course, but a lot of it is user generated. And there, uh, one really has to see, uh, um, see where the editorial responsibility is, because for the traditional broadcasters and for the VOD, it's relatively easy. For VSPs, uh, there is always a bit of a tension because, of course, the platform is responsible to only a certain degree, since a lot of it is uploaded. Uh, of it is uh, uploaded. Let me see. Yeah, uh, we negotiated this uh, directive for over two years, and it finally entered into force on December 2018. Now we are on transposition period. So all the member states, as you know, a directive is not uh, applicable directly like a regulation, but it's the member states who have to transpose it in their national legislation. They have time till uh, September 2020. To, to transpose it and then we will of course from the commission have a look how they transposed it whether there might be some delays i mean this is uh, often the case and we will definitely analyze this then maybe the next slide uh, i am Sorry, I also have to go. <laughs> it's the first time I'm doing it, so please give me some feedback also on the chat if I'm too fast or I don't know, too boring. So um, yes, this one, uh, basically um, I covered most of it. What um, the, the, the rational against, um, the rational behind this revision is really that we want, since consumers actually change their consumption patterns, uh, we, f we, we felt and the policymakers felt that um, there should be similar obligations for comparable services. So it, it would, is really unfair that uh, regular linear TV broadcasters are so heavily regulated, they have to comply to such a, a big fr legislative framework. And for instance, VOD uh, services have a com competitive advantage. So we really wanted to, uh, to increase the regulation for VOD players and uh, for, as I said for video sharing platforms there the discussion is a little bit different but we of course want to responsibilize them because uh, they are intermediaries so we have the e-commerce directive which says that uh, these platforms are not responsible for the content uh, which is posted 
to a certain degree, but this I think politically has has changed, and especially when it comes to hate speech, protection of minor and so on, minors and so on, we from the Commission feel that more has to be done uh, from these platforms. Then the next slide. Um, so this is on the main, the core principle of, of, of the whole directive is the country of origin principle, which is really the, the cornerstone. And what it what it entails is that basically one provider, which is established, you have specific criteria in one member state has to comply only to one set of rules and not 27 sets of rules. So basically here, you really want to faci facilitate the traveling of content. So if I'm, I'm just saying one country in Luxembourg, I have to comply to their rules. And then once it, I comply to them, then I am free to, uh, to provide the content, so freedom of reception to all other 26, 27 member states. So this is like really the main rationale also behind the whole single market in the end, to, to make not only the products, and the capital and so on flow, but also the content in this case. Uh, we should always keep in mind that this is a minimum harmonization uh, directive. I think this is uh, very important also afterwards for accessibility. So basically the member states, uh, they can go, um, they can choose to go beyond what uh, the minimum criteria set out. Uh, the minimum criteria, as I said, they are really um, general interest, uh, general public interest criteria like cultural diversity, protection of the rights uh, of people with disabilities, protection of minors, protection of the consumers. On the other hand, also giving a certain flexibility to the market. Uh, yes, I think this is these are jurisdiction issues that basically it's always the member state where the uh, where the provider is established, which is responsible to check um, to to comply with the set of rules. So the next slide. I have to also check in my slides. Yeah, this is a very um, brief overview on what I'm going to uh, touch upon. I, uh, so basically, here the extension of, the, of these rights, of the audiovisual rights to video sharing platforms, which I think this is one of the things which is quoted uh, most often in, uh, in, uh, in the review of the directive. Then the directive strengthens uh, specific provisions on hate speech and public provocation to commit terrorist offenses. It reinforces provisions on accessibility. This is Article 7. I think today it's going to be the most important one. It enhances the promotion of European works by introducing a, a set of quotas. Then we, we did already have in the old direction uh, a number of measures to protect minors, which are always the most vulnerable. Uh, part of the population and where we should really like uh, have certain measures in place. It, got, it also introduced a certain amount of flexibility for advertising. Then we have rules on findability, on signal integrity. I mean, these things are a bit technical, so I will, I will just really briefly touch upon. And one other important last thing it is that uh, the independence of the regulators got really reinforced, which of course for political reasons it's very important that they, they are not uh, strongly linked to the government. So this, is, uh, this has positive effects on the whole uh, media landscape in terms of media freedom and plurality, because of course it would be very it has negative effects, let's say, if the gov government has a uh, strong ties to the media and can influence it politically or commercially. Then the next slide. Uh, on video sharing platforms here, uh, we really want, I mean, in the whole digital single market strategy, we think that platforms play a bigger and bigger role in our lives. I mean, platform is one, uh, 
uh, I mean, we think of Facebook, of, of Google, of YouTube, and so and so on. But we also think that they have to have a greater responsibility because, uh, I mean, with growing popularity, of course, a lot of young people are are, are, lo are looking at videos um, on on YouTube, for instance. But they have to be also adequately protected. So the definition, what a video sharing platform is, we are now working on guidelines to really establish what it is, because of course, as you know, these things might, we wanted to have a technologically neutral definition, because in five or 10 years, this might be completely different. And the services we use every day for hours these days, they could completely change. So one of the, um, one of the ma major key elements is the principal pur purpose. So we cons consider a VSP if it really has as one of its principal purpose, the sharing of videos. So, but it could be also, for instance, uh, a newspaper who has a uh, dissociable section on videos. This could also be considered a video sharing platform. So we really have to also look at the guidelines where we establish a number of criteria. On, on what it is. One of the others, as you can see, that usually uh, these platforms, they don't uh, have the editorial responsibility on the, on the content. They might have it. And this is really important, uh, this distinction, because of course, uh, if it's the users who are uploading, uh, the, the, plat uh, the, up uploading the content, the platform can, can only be held liable to a certain extent. And here also, I, that the platform usually provides that there has to be some sort of curating function, which nowadays all these platforms usually have. There is like, um, yeah, they do, they have certain algorithms. I'm checking the word algorithm here, it's spelled wrongly since it's not only a complicated concept in itself, <laughs> it's also difficult to write. So we can... Uh, correct this. Yes. So then, yeah, for instance, for the platforms, uh, there are the um, are really a set of obligation. It's quite, it's quite technical and it's a little bit complicated. But for instance, for minors, they have to ensure that there are parental control systems, age verification systems, so that you actually need to, to tick that you're 18, which, as we know, sometimes is not always enough, but of course, if it's tied to credit card information or so, Jared can really be uh, much more effective. Then rating of content by users, this is a little bit like we know it also on linear TV, where you see that this is adequate for a certain uh, age range and so on. And we uh, platforms have to encourage, I mean, uh, have to have all these measures in place. In terms of hate, uh, incitement to hatred and violence, uh, which constitutes a criminal offense, there the platforms have to include this in their terms of references, which they all do, terms and conditions, but they have to ensure that there is a flagging mechanism. So basically that you can really like as a user say, okay, this content uh, is potentially hate speech, please take it down. And they also have to ensure a, a complaint mechanism. So at the beginning, the complaint mechanism is between you and the platform. But if you are not happy with what the platform uh, responds to you, then you can also have uh, seek first out of court um, settlements or otherwise, ultimately, you can go to a court, which of course is a little bit more time uh, consuming. They have to respect, I mean, for audiovisual commercial communications, this is how we call advertisements. They have to respect also some basic uh, transparency requirements. So now we have all these uh, Instagrammers, influencers and so on, but they basically have to say if they get paid for promoting this, uh, this and that brand. The checking up on this is sometimes very difficult. But there is also we encourage co-regulation in this uh, in this respect. The next slide. Yes, very quickly for protection of minors, there were a lot of provisions already in place. Uh, 
which um, entail that, for instance, for harmful content should be uh, restricted on uh, on demand services and on TV broadcasts, so on Netflix and on TV broadcast. And most harmful content, for instance, pornography uh, should be subject to the strictest measures, which means usually it's like pin codes that in order to access this, you would need to give pin codes. Then uh, content description, uh, description, this is again, these like little signs that uh, often you see in TV, on, on linear TV, but also on VOD, where it says which age this content is appropriate for, which it isn't. So it's all indicators. And again, here, co-regulation is encouraged. Co-regulation actually means we have self-regulation, co-regulation, and law. It's a form of soft law where the industry works together with the regulatory authorities, which are really the expert in this field, and tries to find suitable and effective solution, solutions and measures. Then let me go on to the next provision, which is on promotion of European works. So, so here it says cultural diversity. Of course, this is the overall objective. So here the co-legislator during the re revision, they really re wanted to reinforce the obligation for VOD players because uh, the, for TV, the broadcasters, they must already ensure that 50% of the content you see on TV has to be dedicated to European works and 10% to, to independent works. But now we extended this also to services such as Netflix. So they have to ensure that 30% of their content is European works, which we think um, will create a minimal level of diversity. And they, are also, they, they also have to contribute financially to the creation of European content. And again, how this will work in, in practice, uh, we are now uh, really working since, I don't know, six months on guidelines for the, for the promotion of these European works. Let me just briefly tell, give you, touch upon commercial communication on the rules which we have here. So basically we already had uh, the prohibition of uh, advertisement for tobacco uh, products and for prescription um, medication. This is of course uh, protection of consumers in general. When it comes to alcohol, uh, they are restricted usually to a certain uh, time. So there is a watershed on it, basically that they can be broadcast only after nine. It depends a little bit on the member states because also I think the, the broadcasting times uh, are not the same, the traditions in all the member states. And this is really to reduce the exposure of children to also un unhealthy foods, high in fat, salt and sugar. These are the qu qualitative rules. In terms of quantitative rules, because we saw that a lot of advertising revenue is going, I uh, guess <laughs> you are dealing with the slides, is going towards the, the platforms, which is a huge problem, of course, uh, also for broadcasters, because uh, platforms are able to, through their uh, granular data they have on all the users, to really do a lot of micro-targeting. We decided to have more flexibility when it comes to, to advertisement limits. And you can read it on the slides. I mean, it's a little <coughs> bit complicated also how, but basically to give more flexibility to the broadcasters in that respect without actually uh, disregarding, of course, the consumer protection and without allowing more advertisement. <coughs> then the next slide. Greater role for self and co-regulation. This, I think, I already explained a little bit. We work really, we try because, of course, uh, this is a legislative proposal which needs to be transposed by the member states, and the member states all have their independent regulatory authorities with lots of experience in how to regulate the online world, the linear world. We we really also want to uh, reinforce the collaboration with them. And I'm the ne the next top 
the next provision is on media literacy. I'm giving you a very broad overview. I, I realize that sometimes the, the topics are a bit, but of course, if you have specific questions, you can ask me afterwards. So here, media literacy, what is, we, we want to, we want to promote uh, and to encourage the member states to, to promote media literacy actions. So under media literacy, what you can is, is this aspect of critical thinking that you're actually, um, that you can navigate today's uh, media environment in a beneficial way. And we would like to encourage member states to do some, to, to do much more, not only in schools, but all, also in non-formal um, education, to really make them more resilient also to uh, phenomena such as disinformation, for instance. So we are, for instance, this year again doing uh, the second Media Literacy Week. Last year we had the first edition to increase the visibility and to discuss more about this topic, what can be done to, to reinforce it in, in every member state. Okay, so I'm, we are almost at the end here. Um, the, the One of the last slides, um, talks about the independence of audiovisual regulator. In every member state, you have, you have an audiovisual uh, regulator. So for instance, in the UK, it's uh, Ofcom. In Italy, it's Agicom. And what we wanted to put in the directive is that they are really, they have to be legally distinct and functionally independent from their government, which is very important because before, often they were like incorporated in different ministries and and so on but then of course it's more difficult for them to operate in a completely independent way which for for the media environment and for media pluralism and media diversity reasons it's extremely important uh, and they have also um, ensure that they have adequate uh, financial and human resources so that then they can actually operate in, operate in a meaningful way this Re these regulators, they uh, they are put together in ERGA, which is uh, which is basically the heads of the regulatory authorities, and they meet in our expert group of ERGA on a number of topics and subtopics. One of it is also accessibility. So this was discussed last year in one of the subtopics, uh, and it's really a great forum for exchanging experiences for exchanging best practices, uh, for also uh, discussing challenges or what could uh, what could be done better in terms of cooperation and so on. And we this year we will have in the ERGA um, uh, work program a, a focus on jurisdiction and also on findability. Let me... Um, conclude uh, this presentation with the challenges uh, on the transposition. So, of course, one of the biggest challenges is the, um, the consistent approach, because as you know, as a directive, I mean, it leaves a lot of leeway also for the member states to decide on certain things. But we really have to ensure that the, the core provisions uh, are, are, are correctly transposed. We are going to be um, helping member states with the transposition, and we are also in constant exchange with them in the contact committee. And we, all, we would also like to, um, to underline that the regulators in this respect really have a, a wealth of expertise. This is why we count a lot on ERGA's help with it. And then, of course, now we will have to wait also till September, till everybody has transposed it. And then we will, we will have to analyze how it was transposed. And if we see any shortcomings, we will uh, have to take this up with the member state. So yes, this was my presentation on the AVMSD. I hope you have a little bit an overview on the really different uh, things and provisions it tackles. And if you have any questions, I'm here. Yes, thank you very much, Lara. This was really interesting. And we already have a couple of questions. I would suggest we take only two questions for now so that we don't uh, leave 
um, a very long break for Alejandro to continue and then take the rest of the questions in the end. So the first question that was asked uh, to Lara was, does the AVMSD apply to regional broadcasters as well? There are bigger public and commercial national broadcasters, but we also have broadcasters on a city or provincial or regional level. Since they have limited manpower and financial resources, what do you advise with regard to qualitative and quantitative requirements for the regional broadcasters? This was the first question. And the second question, I will also already say it now, and then maybe Lara, you can take them both together, is what about newspaper video platforms and accessibility? So um, I will pass back the microphone to Lara <clears throat> to answer these questions. Well, as such, the AVMSD uh, applies uh, to all providers, uh, also, of course, on a regional level. But it is true that um, basically the regional providers need to comply to the to the to, with their national law. So with the law which was transposed by the AVMSD. So in the end, the providers always comply with the national law, which as a, how can I say, like as a, which had already transposed the AVMSD. And often the AVMSD becomes applicable only in cross-border cases, because uh, this is where it becomes, let's say, interesting. So sometimes I think for regional providers, the AVMSD is is a is a framework uh, which was transposed but it's not always relevant because there is not not a cross-border dimension to it i don't know it's a little bit complicated but uh, i hope i explained it correctly and when it comes to uh, newspaper platforms they are partly covered um if they are if they fall into into the definition of being vsps so if they have a dissociable section but on the other hand vsps for instance are not uh, i mean to vsps article 7 does not apply so article 7 all the provisions on accessibility only apply to linear broadcasters and to vod broadcasters so video on demand broadcasters not to vsps because not not to these platforms because there the editorial responsibility is not given so this is really important to make this distinction thank you very much again lara i think alejandro <clears throat> will actually go into a little bit more detail about these aspects of accessibility and um uh, how to um basically use transposition effectively so i will hand over to alejandro and please uh, keep your questions coming and we will take them at the end thank you very much marie um, well yes i'm alejandro moledo also policy coordinator at the european disability forum and i'm gonna be um explain a little bit uh, in detail uh, the provisions of the AVMSD when it comes to accessibility on how to uh, make use of this legislation to advance on media accessibility, which is obviously one of the goals of EDF and, and our members. So next slide. I will go through the, um, the five uh, main provisions in Article 7. Article 7, let's say, is our article, is the article about accessibility. These five provisions are making the audiovisual services accessible, reporting on progress made on, on this uh, progress on accessibility, accessibility actions plan, which is uh, merely a recommendation, information and complaints mechanism for media accessibility as well. And the fifth and last one is accessibility of emergency information. So I will start uh, the next slide by, um, okay, um, I will touch upon what does the AVMSD cover and also what does not cover. So we will explain to you uh, which aspects uh, will be covered by other legislation such as uh, the European Accessibility Act. Next slide. So let's begin with paragraph one of Article 7 that reads that member states shall ensure without undue delay that services provided in media service providers under their jurisdiction are made 
continuously and progressively more accessible to persons with disability with disabilities throughout uh, proportionate uh, measures. Next slide. What what does it mean um, this provision? And have we seen in the past in the previous audio ABMSD was that some countries did take advantage of this uh, of this opportunity and did advance on on media accessibility, whereas others uh, remained behind and did not actually uh, work to improve the the equal access to audiovisual media services in their countries. So. What we are proposing, and I must, I must say that all the recommendations that uh, I will give you in this presentation are uh, presented in way more detail in a toolkit that you will find at the end of this presentation. It's also uploaded on, on the EDF website in which we give, we give further explanation and details on how to um, take the best out of these, uh, these provisions. So, Going back to the first paragraph of um, Article 7, what we are proposing is to ensure that at a national level, when this directive is, let's say, translated into national law, uh, the transposition that was mentioned in Lara, um, we need to ensure that this provision, this first paragraph of Article 7, which is the most important one, is detailed in quantitative and qualitative targets. What does it mean? We want to advance on, on the main um, access services, as we call them. This webinar, for instance, has have different access services, such as subtitles and sign language interpretation. So if you look at the recital 23 in the directive, you will see that it mentions the four main access services for media, which are uh, subtitles for the deaf and hard of hearing, audio description, sign language interpretation, and spoken subtitles. So to develop this article and to ensure that we progress on media accessibility, we propose uh, to national authorities to establish, uh, so either the government uh, um, or the policymakers deciding the law or the national authorities to uh, set these targets, these quantitative targets with clear timelines um, for all these or the relevant access services in your country. Meaning that, for instance, if your country doesn't have uh, any um, uh, provision of sign language interpretation, the, this quantitative target will define that by 2022, you will have 5% of the overall content um, with sign language interpretation. By the next year, 7%. By the following one, 9%. And same same approach for um, audio description or subtitles for the deaf and hard of hearing. So a clear um, timeline on progress on the different access services that are important in your country. But it's also uh, crucial to set qualitative uh, targets or qualitative um, aspects of these access services because it's not the same to have, um, let's say, a subtitle, which is just a translation of what is being said, that having subtitles for the deaf and hard of hearing, which also convey the non-speech information, such as music or the noise of a window um, breaking, or um, going to another um, access service, uh, how big uh, the sign language interpretation should be on the screen, all these qualitative aspects should be also defined in the development of the um, national legislation. And to do this, you can either use uh, standards uh, that you may have at national level, standards for audio description, for sign language interpretation, for subtitles for the deaf and hard of hearing. But also, uh, if you don't have national standards in the toolkit, we also provide you with references to international standards that you can um, adapt and agree uh, at the national level between the different stakeholders, um, organizations of persons with disabilities and audiovisual media service providers. So it's very important, once again, to ensure this progress and this quality in, um, in media accessibility over time with clear timelines. And now I'll move to the next 
uh, provision of the of the Article 7, which is uh, reporting. Is uh, member states uh, shall ensure that media services uh, providers report on a regular basis to the national regulatory uh, authorities. Next slide. Um, yeah, but what does it mean on regular basis? Um, this is something that needs to be clarified at national level. Uh, what services, how often, all these aspects should be taken into consideration when national authority, uh, national policy makers develop the provisions of this uh, of this article. So it should be clear, clearly stated that this should be done, for instance, annually, the, the report should be uh, made accessible and available to, to the general public. Um, what content uh, these reports uh, will include? Uh, obviously, we want this report to be clear on the progress made when it comes to those targets that hopefully will be uh, set up at national level. So this reporting should uh, reflect the, the ambition at national level when developing this, uh, this legislation. Next slide, please. Let's move now to the third uh, provision, which is uh, a tricky one because it seems good and it can be very good, but um, it's just an encouragement, it's a recommendation. It reads, member states shall encourage media service providers to develop accessibility action plans in respect to continuously, well, to progress on, on, on media accessibility. These action plans, uh, and I will move to the next uh, slide, these action plans are very good in principle, but, and this is um, crucial to remember, they should not uh, replace the quantitative and qualitative targets that we were mentioning before. So we should not accept these action plans as the way in which um, a given country will progress on media accessibility. These action plans are a great idea and we support the development of these action plans for audiovisual media service providers, so for the public and commercial TV channels or for, your, or for the video on demand platforms, meaning the Netflix and HBO in your country, to explain how they plan to, to meet the um, to reach those uh, quantitative and qualitative targets to advance on, on on media accessibility. But these action plans are not sufficient to, from our point of view, to ensure that uh, we will advance in, in this regard. We believe that to in order if they are they are going to to prepare these action plans it will be good to consult persons with disabilities and and to sit down and say okay we want to uh, improve our subtitles for the deaf and hard of hearing and therefore they should meet with the community and discuss how this can be done they should also uh, adapt their own uh, contracting policies meaning if i'm a TV channel and I want to, to buy um, a new movie, uh, I need to ensure that when I buy this movie, I buy win, with, sorry, with the access services included in the price, so with the subtitles and the, and the audio, audio description. Otherwise, I will need to prepare those uh, in-house, so by the, by the TV channel itself or the uh, video on demand platform and uh, we also recommend that to do to do so to to prepare this uh, this action plan they can make use of the recently the well it was last year uh, adopted european standard on design for all that uh, will help any organization including uh, tv channels um, to achieve accessibility by embracing um, universal design or design for all approach in how they manage the organization internally. And obviously, if they, are, if they will prepare uh, action plans, it would be great if they make them available and accessible to the public. I will move to the next question, the next um, slide, which is about the fourth uh, paragraph, the fourth provision of this Article 7, which um, deals with the the, the single um, uh, online contact point 
for users to get information about the, the accessibility of their audiovisual media services and also to lodge complaints. Um, um, next slide. We believe that this, this article has a lot of potential uh, if it's, uh, it is further developed at national level, um, primarily by ensuring that it's not only um, the communication uh, can go beyond just the, the online, um, the online uh, procedure and, and, and uh, at national level, there are other ways uh, accessible, obviously, to contact this um, this uh, this service to get information on uh, what is the next uh, movie that will be broadcasted with audio description, for example. Or um, yesterday, I wanted to watch the um, the I don't know the the, the news and the, the subtitles were completely wrong. Uh, they were not synchronized with the audio those kind of complaints could be uh, lots, uh, could be um, sent to this contact point for uh, potential follow-up and this brings me to one of the um, one of the questions we we have when it comes to this paragraph what would happen um, then if uh, if a complaint is received then national uh, policymakers need to specify and clarify what will happen when they receive complaints? Will it be penalties? Will it be remedial action? Um, this, in the toolkit, uh, we provide you with some ideas on what are the different aspects that uh, could be included in this. Um, obviously, uh, this uh, should be uh, independent. Uh, this contact uh, point should be independent from the from the from the providers of the service. That that makes total sense and uh, should be transparent as well. Let's move to the next next slide, which is um, uh, the fifth and last um, paragraph uh, of the Article 7 and deals with emergency communication. In the case of an emergency, sometimes uh, authorities um, uh, broadcast uh, information to their citizens. And, and Next slide, please. And obviously, um, this paragraph um, uh, underlines that the information must be accessible for persons with disabilities. There is no doubt about it. And to, to achieve this, we recommend that at national level, uh, all stakeholders sit down and discuss different procedures and codes of conduct. So when these situations, hopefully not, but if these situations happen, they, they will know how to react. They will know that if they broadcast emergency information, it needs, it must always include subtitles for the deaf and hard of hearing and sign language interpretation. Next slide, I will try to speed up as we are reaching to our end and we want to allow you uh, for some, uh, allow some, some discussion afterwards and questions. So what does the ABMSD uh, not cover? Um, aspects such as the access, um, let's say the, the gateways to this uh, to this audio to these audiovisual uh, services, for example, the website of, of the TV channel or the the mobile app of your of the video on demand platform. Those aspects are not covered by by the um, by the by this directive. However, they are covered by the upcoming European Accessibility Act for which we will also uh, prepare a toolkit and organize a webinar to, to deep <laughs> inside, the, inside it and also get the best out of it. But in this regard, uh, you should already mention to your public authorities so when you talk with them that these aspects or how to access the content will be covered by the, um, by the European Accessibility Act transposition and therefore they can start uh, by um, by including them in the reforms uh, to comply to transpose this directive, the audiovisual media service directive. So they save time. Um, obviously, the, uh, the video sharing platforms such as YouTube uh, don't have any accessibility requirement, uh, unfortunately. Um, basically, because most of the content, as Lara was explaining, is user generated and websites of, uh, of newspapers, uh, as we already discussed, uh, are not covered unless they are considered uh, an audiovisual media service uh, provider. So imagine that The Guardian 
the newspaper the guardian suddenly de decide to to have a the guardian tv and and they become a, a an audiovisual media service provider therefore they have editorial responsibility and they will need to make their services accessible next slide um we also i won't go too much into details on on this last slide i believe uh, you will find them all in the in the toolkit here we will give you some further ideas because obviously when a directive uh, arrives at national level there is an opportunity to go beyond as lara explained this is a minimum harmonization and therefore you can propose uh, different aspects at national level that will improve the overall situation when it comes to media accessibility. So, for example, here we are proposing um, that you uh, advocate for um, uh, public funds when public funds are uh, used for the production of audiovisual content. If there is public money involved, that uh, final audiovisual content, that film that was funded with uh, public money, will need to include always uh, the development, the, the production of subtitles, for example, or of the description. And I won't go too much into the other aspects that you will find them all in the um, in the toolkit. And I will finish with the for sure the last slide, <laughs> which is uh, to act now because um, even though countries will certainly be delayed in the transposition of this directive, it's very important that we raise awareness among the, the media providers at national level, among organizations of persons with disability, uh, policymakers, everybody should be aware of all the potential um, of this uh, directive and, 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 and we should act as soon as possible to ensure that this, um, these aspects will be included in, in your national legislation. And I will leave it there and happy to, to answer any, any question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alejandro. And uh, indeed, many questions we have. So we have now 10 more minutes before the end of the webinar. And I suggest I will again go in the chronological order of the questions. So we have one that still relates to Lara's presentation. So I would give that maybe directly to Lara. And the other ones we will see a little bit who is maybe um, interested or who, who of you two can answer this better. This question here is about the country of origin principle that you mentioned in the first presentation. So in particularly in relation to the dis to disability hate crime. Country of whose origin? The platform, the content owner, the complainer? Generally, it would be interesting to know how this protection against incitement of violence, hate speech will be enforced in practice. Uh, yes, very interesting question and it really touches upon one of the issues which have been discussed now the last uh, years or at least uh, uh, months uh, during uh, the last legislative period. So basically country of origin always means uh, the country of the establisher, uh, the establishment where the provider is established. So either for the broadcaster or, or for the video on demand, but even for the VSPs. So basically VSP, just to give you a very practical ex example, they have uh, Facebook is established in <coughs> Ireland. So if you have a complaint as a user, uh, when it comes to incitement to violence or hatred, you would need, um, the platform needs to ensure that you can flag this content, but that you can also contact them and launch the complaint with them. So in practice, this means that, yes, it's the Irish uh, regulator or the Irish authorities. First, it's, of course, Facebook who is responsible. But if there are any problems, the user can complain with the Irish regulator or with the I Irish uh, authorities. What we would really like to work on now in the next legislative uh, period is a cooperation mechanism between the regulators, which would actually ensure that if you are, let's say, uh, an Austrian citizen, you don't have to go to Ireland because it might be also, I mean, you don't have to go to the Irish regulator also in terms of language and so on uh, 
it might be more difficult, but to ensure a collaborative structure where you can actually go to your Austrian regulator, complain there, and it is facilitated uh, through this uh, through this uh, regulation. But this is outstanding. I mean, uh, we will work on this in the future. Okay, thank you, Lara. I have actually two questions that are more general, so maybe I will put them together. And maybe um, Alejandro wants to take these because he hasn't said anything yet on the question. So one question is, can you give concrete examples of audiovisual media services, please? And the second question that is also related to that is that um, a question about uh, audio description for blind people, because mm -hmm. that was uh, not mentioned. Is that included? Yeah, okay. Um, okay, yes, we should, actually we should have uh, started with, um, with this this question and uh, we're sorry. Uh, audiovisual media service um, can be any TV program. Lara, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, any TV program, you know, series, films, news, uh, soap operas. Um, so it, it does really uh, mean that the, the audiovisual content uh, that we we can watch on TV or in or in these uh, video sharing platforms such as YouTube or uh, sorry Netflix or HBO. I don't know if Lara you want to complement. No, it's no. perfect. Okay. I mean, <laughs> it's any moving image. Uh, mentioned in this recital 23. No. What? It's, it's on. on. It's on. No, it's on. It's okay. It's on? Okay. Are we live? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, other description uh, is indeed mentioned in, in, our, in the recital uh, 23 uh, of the AVMSD and is one of the four main access services available in, in Europe and obviously is one of the is one of the access services that we it needs uh, quantitative targets uh, as well and clear definition um, of its quality so the the audio mix for example on the audio description and the audio track of the movie for example needs to be done properly um, uh, we should have this kind of clear rules so uh, as it as it happened in the past uh, unfortunately TV channels don't trick in like repeating the same audio description, um, how they describe the movie over and over again to, to meet the, the, the quota. So these kind of uh, aspects we need to, to bear in mind when discussing at national level. Thanks, Alejandro. I have actually, I'm, I'm going to go against uh, my principle that I said I will go in chronological order because I have two questions that are about transposition. And uh, so they go quite well together. I will start with the first one, which is, do we already see a specific trend in implementation of the accessibility provisions at the national level? And I suppose with this, they mean the, the transposition. And are there countries who are taking a bolder approach by setting up a quantitative quantitative thresholds or timelines, for example. This is the first question. And the other one is specifically about uh, in the Netherlands, um, we are already faced with the fact that a proposal for the transposition has already been sent to Parliament without consulting disabled persons organizations. So when the Dutch government will not transpose Article 7 about accessibility, what can we do on EU level? Infringement procedure is only an option after a couple of years. After after first making a report. So I think these are actually two really good questions and maybe our expert from the commission um, has a question, uh, an answer about that. Um, but I will maybe first pass to Lara and then if you want to add something, Alejandro. Yeah. Yes, here uh, the, the the answer has to be very uh, will will how can I say like uh, we will we from the Commission we really have to wait for this transposition period to be uh, to be over so we have to, we'll have to wait till September 2020 and then look at the specific at all the laws if we identify problems then we of course uh, I mean it's our duty to uh, to start infringement procedures but at this 
this stage, I, I can't really say, like, I have to say that there have, has been only one notification, I think, of Denmark and a partial notification of Germany. Otherwise, all the other member states, I mean, have part they have started of course because uh, time is uh, is really running out but uh, we, we will have to wait and then uh, we definitely if there is a main if there if we identify a major problems we, we will we will uh, go after the member state and uh, try try to solve them in terms of quant quantita qual uh, quantitative rules, um, the member states are free to go beyond what is in the directive and they have done so. So uh, there are certainly member states which are much more um, bolder in their approach. I don't want to name now the countries, but uh, this is, um, the, um, how, how can I say, this is really depending also a little bit on their traditions let's say, and since for us, we cannot go, we cannot impose this, this was not in the negotiations, I mean, there was a lot of, we wanted to also, or there was a, a, a strong push to introduce quantitative uh, rules, which of course uh, would have uh, made a lot of sense also but this was a, a very hard negotiation and in the end it we we put in the text which i think also already indicates that there should be really a lot of, of progress made in this field do you wanted to add on that question on transposition or no i, I can say that um in the toolkit we do mention uh, the case of uk which has been i believe uh, the um, one of the uh, countries that uh, has uh, advanced uh, media accessibility um, strongly uh, and, uh, and i would encourage you to to check the resources that we provide in the toolkit to show to your national government that uh, your your national policy makers that is possible, and thanks to this approach, um, when it comes to quantitative and qualitative targets, um, things move forward actually, and, and more people have access to to audiovisual content. Okay, thanks a lot. So we have three more questions on the list, and seeing as though it's already three o'clock, I would say we close the list of questions now. But obviously, if you have have any further questions um, apart from these three remaining ones feel free to email us and we will of course get back to you uh, in writing later so um, I have one question here we actually it's more of a comment and wonder what uh, our speakers might uh, answer to this so viewers need to be able to see the dates when accessibility features such as subtitles have been revised for example the BBC iPlayer subtitles get corrected in the days after transmission but viewers cannot see whether they have been fixed without re-downloading the programs. This is a potentially costing money in repeated downloads. Who of you would like to um, comment on that? Yeah, well, that's a rather technical technical question, but it's true, and this is something that we we highlight in the toolkit that is not the same um live subtitling as the one we are having in this webinar then uh professional subtitling afterwards uh, so with um pre-recorded video and uh, co um, complying with the with the standards of quality for subtitling subtitling for the deaf and hard of hearing which is also different from country to country so that's why we stress that um, the the aspect of quality should be clearly stated in the in the rollout of the legislation at national level by referring to um, commonly agreed standards for quality again or if you don't have it uh, at national level because there are some countries that have not for instance have not a single hour of audio description for example in in their whole um, media ecosystem so for those countries uh, there are some resources internationally that they can adapt to their needs at national level great i received actually one more question but since it's a very <laughs> short one i will tag it on to another question which i think also lara might be able to answer it's about more the scope of the directive so the first part is how does the avmsd affect accessibility of minority languages and the add-on question is 
are commercials mm -hmm. also audiovisual content? Mm -hmm. the, the second one is very easy. Yes, they are. <laughs> That's why I thought it was a yes, commercial. Absolutely. And uh, the, the first one, uh, no, I mean, we don't regulate the. Of course, there might be minor minority uh, programs which are broadcast and so on, but we don't, as such, regulate uh, the content. I mean, we don't give any specific quota uh, in this regard. We we do have we, we say that 50% of the broadcasting broadcasts on linear TV need to be dedicated to European works. So basically, not American uh, works, let's say, or, or Chinese, or uh, from from any other country in the world. But but uh, I mean, it is not um, these catalogs and so on. Also, for instance, when it comes to VOD, they can be national um, national content, like stemming from France and so on. They can be filled by only content coming from France, let's say in France, even though, of course, our idea is to increase the diversity of European content. So we encourage also the, the, the purchase of other content, your European content, but it's, we don't have a spe specific category for regional or minority languages. But they mentioned accessibility in, the first, uh, in this question. Um, uh, just how how uh, how does the AVMSD affect accessibility of minority language? Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, um, um, I would I would just uh, complement uh, by saying that accessibility can also be uh, access services can also be very beneficial to minority languages uh, by having um, subtitles. Most of us, well, uh, many of us, uh, learned. Or improve uh, our language skills by um, watching content with subtitle, uh, with subtitles, for example. So um, accessibility, as we say, uh, accessibility is crucial for persons with disabilities, but it's actually beneficial to all societies. So. Yeah. Great. So one last question. Actually, this links maybe nicely or finishes off this topic on the AVMSD and links already to the next uh, topic, uh, which Ar Ar Alejandro mentioned earlier, the Accessibility Act. Mm -hmm. So um, the person would like to know, so programs might get audio description, but TV interface with the button to turn it on might remain inaccessible until Accessibility Act is in force. Very yeah. So Alejandro, I think you have a very good answer on that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the, the Accessibility Act covers um, the devices, so your smartphone, your tablet, your TV, uh, whatever other uh, device we'll have in the future. So it covers this user interface, so that button that is currently not accessible. It covers also as I said before, the access to the audiovisual content, so the device is accessible, but then you need the website or the app to be accessible as well, or even the electronic, those menus in which we find all the programs and, and, and we want to know which one of them has a description, which one has subtitles, which one. So those uh, access, those uh, points of access to the content are covered by the Accessibility Act and the content um, will be covered by the AVMSD at national level. Great, um, so thank you very much. I think um, we went a little bit over time, but it wasn't too bad. Um, thanks a lot to our speakers here today. Uh, thank you to our sign language interpreter, to the capture, obviously, also to our other colleagues who helped today here in the office, and of course to you, the participants. I um, will hint, hint again at the toolkit for transposition for the AVMSD, um, which uh, has been prepared by our colleague Meher, who unfortunately cannot be here today, but uh, he's with us in spirit, exactly. and he will also reply to your questions in exactly. case you want to know yeah. more about the toolkit. Um, Eva, maybe if you can put the last slide there, you have the link. And it's also the, all the slides are uh, in the handouts of this webinar and will also be published later for all the participants. So I think I mentioned everything. Um, I, I hope you enjoyed it. Join us for the next webinar and have a nice day. Bye. 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 To be continued.